Yeah. I didn't tell them to do that. They just keep standing up. <laughs> Is that working? Oh, yeah. I'm going to speak right there. All right. Because I've got it close to it. Oh, these are fun. They're very smooth. <laughs> uh, how's it going, Brian? Well, I'm calibrating to make sure I yes. land on the uh, face. You can make a moment before I fall off. You're so high now. It's going to be like five minutes of this. That's right. You can go lower if you want. Good start. Good start. All right. Cool. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, why don't you go ahead and just introduce yourself and tell everybody who might have not heard about photography what you guys have done. Uh, sure thing. So I'm the uh, CEO, co-founder of Photography. Uh, for those who don't know us, we are a fitness social network, and we help people uh, get in better shape through community and coaching. Um, we've been around for about three and a half years now. We're New York based. Uh, we've got the user base of over 1.6 million users. Um, How many? 1.6 million. Um, and people often describe our community as being especially unique because it's just incredibly um, engaged and active. Um, people spend their social fitness identities on photography. They're really uh, kind of building lots of relationships on there, um, having offline meetups and all sorts of other things that kind of bleed into the rest of their lives. Um, so we've been doing that for quite some time, and uh, if anyone here is you know, at all interested in uh, uh, what we do, you can check us out. We're on the App Store. Just search for, for uh, photography. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's just kind of something that's been a big passion of ours for some time, and, and uh, we're proud, of, proud to do what we do. What made you start this community? Uh, well, I mean, initially, it wasn't about starting a community, so in so much as it was to create a better way to track workouts, actually. So um, uh, when I started with my partner back in 2010, it was all about uh, making fitness into a game, right? So we grew up playing all these classic RPGs and video games. Um, later on in life, got into strength training and bodybuilding, and we were like, well, uh, progressing inside the gym is kind of like leveling up a video game. And this was before gamification was a buzzword. We figured, you know, if you earn points for your workouts and leveled up, that would be pretty cool. So that's how we initially got our start um, in 2010, 2011. And then as we started layering on some social features in there, because that was a thing you were supposed to do at the time, um, that's how the social network actually started to uh, come about uh, in 2011. And most of your early members all came from Reddit. That's right. Correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. I don't think Eric Martin is still here, but he told us all about that. Was, which subreddit was it? Well, you know. Was it murder it was, No, no, it was the <laughs> fitness. <laughs> there was the fitness subreddit. Um, at the time, I think they had maybe 100,000 uh, subscribers to it. And uh, it was really just the perfect intersection of fitness and you know, millennials who had grown up playing lots of video games, spending a lot of time on the internet. And I still remember at the end of 2010 when we were making our initial pitch to that community about what we were building. Um, and it generated a lot of excitement, much to our you know, surprise and delight. And that's, the, that's really how the initial community was seeded, because they checked out what we were doing, they signed up, and started using it. Did you post it there or someone else? Uh, I did. I, uh, I remember I was kind of writing this long missive of, you know, here's what we're all about. And it's a really super crappy website right now, but we really hope you check it out. And uh, we position it as this RPG for fitness. And we knew that, well, we figured that message might resonate with the uh, audience over there, and as it turned out, it did. So you didn't get trolled? No. Uh, fortunately, we didn't get trolled then. We started getting trolled later on. Um, the price will come eventually. The price of growth. Cool. So what, what is it that, so there's a lot of fitness communities online, there's a lot of ways that people are talking about health, um, what made photography so sticky, what made everybody want to use that when there are so many other options already? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question, and I think that the response to that um, changes over time when you look back in history, right? So in 2010, 2011, um, there were plenty of fitness applications and websites that were emerging at the time. Um, uh, when we look at the mobile space, we weren't mobile for uh, a while, we weren't mobile until 2012. Um, what differentiated us 
Um, the size of game application, which we'll get into in a sec, is that a lot of these fitness applications were geared towards runners or cyclists, uh, so on and so forth. And for us, we were actually uh, quite uh, geared towards the gym and people who were, you know, maybe they were strength training, and, and you know, our backgrounds were in strength training, so that we were just kind of building towards what we do. And as it turns out, at the time, there really weren't any competing services out there that were doing a great job in fulfilling the need out there. Uh, in terms of workout tracking. There were a few out there that were you know, pretty poorly designed and kind of janky, and, and really the extent of it um, was message boards, you know, like kind of the, the VBB sort of stuff from you know, the web of those days. Uh, so I think that in and of itself was, you know, we, we, we found that kind of gym or niche that um, was really interested in that, and being able to track your workouts uh, more easily, and then the gamification element, I think, was also really important as well. Uh, nowadays, gamification as a design strategy is, um, you know, it's kind of well-worn territory for, for a lot of folks. Um, when we started building it, it was before we ever thought that was a buzzword. Um, and uh, I think that was really what brought the initial stickiness. When they were first making up the word. That's right. We should have coined that initially, but, you know, we were late to that. We missed that one. Well, so what made it work? So, like, gamification, I think... What I've always seen is like gamification works when it's a representation of like an existing um, reputation system that's going on. But then if you just start slapping badges on everything and telling people that they're, you know, leveling up, it doesn't work unless they actually care, right? So why do they care? Uh, well, it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier, which is with health and fitness, um, a big part of it uh, is about making progression, right? Um, when you think about the feedback loop that someone experiences when they're starting to exercise. A huge part of what fuels them to continue is to see ongoing improvements, right? If you're spinning your wheels and you're not seeing any changes in your performance or your body, then you kind of just are inclined to give up. And so this natural progression mechanism was a, a very strong, had a very strong parallel with gamification and gamification elements. So exactly what you said is that a lot of people are tempted to use that in other applications where there's not necessarily a really strong fit. Um, but I think it's also really important to note, especially given the theme of, of all this, is you know, gamification, we consider that um, the initial part of the one to punch for the photography experience. So we always talk about gamification being the initial draw for people coming into photography, but community is what keeps people around. Um, and there's a tweet for you. <laughs> yeah, so people come from gamification to stay with the community. It's, it's something that we've said um, quite a bit uh, with photography. Um, as it turns out, the community is not necessarily the first thing that, people on, that is on people's minds when they first join us. Right? So you need something to draw them initially, and then give it enough time in a kind of single player mode, then they're going to start to engage with the community. That's really interesting. Yeah, I think like, you see a lot that community isn't necessarily a great selling point. Because people don't come to a website and they're like, man, I really wish I could meet some strangers right now and I can hang out. Like, but once they're in there and they start to develop the relationships, that's what keeps them around. School. So, okay, so we understand kind of how you started, some of the mechanisms. Um, now it's grown to millions of users, and you've changed your product several times, you've changed things in the community. What are the biggest challenges that you really face to keep this community healthy? Uh, what are some bigger mistakes you made and tried to fix? Yeah, um, I think one of the earlier points that was brought up by Jason is um, the idea of setting expectations with the community. I think one of the things that we did well in 2011 was uh, being in constant communication with the community, explaining what was on the roadmap, um, soliciting the feedback, getting their opinions on what was going well, what wasn't, and then building towards that. Um, but something that we ran into time and time again was saying, okay, here's a feature that we're going to go after, and we're gonna release this in two months. And it, it, we get even went so far as to have this entire like, month by month plan, uh, what we were going to release with users, and that initially got a lot of, um, it built a lot of goodwill with the community, and they really loved that. But as it turns out, timelines change, uh, estimations are never accurate, um, priorities shift. And so as we started shifting the direction of the business and the product development, and we weren't hitting these kind of deadlines that we had arbitrarily set in the past, yeah, there was a lot of unrest, a lot of uh, displeasure, and so you know, we just basically straight, straight out said, we're not going to do that anymore. We're not going to um, talk about what we're building 
um, you know, at least to the degree of uh, specifics that we had previously. And that was kind of painful for us because we had prided ourselves on being very, very open with the, uh, with the community. Um, it almost felt like we were becoming more defensive. But I think that was really becoming important as the scale of the community was growing, and especially because as the community grows, you're going to start to see power users emerge. And, and not just individual power users, but almost uh, tribes of power users that will convene. And, and you know, they, it feels like they're, they have this kind of sense of ownership over the product. Uh, it's theirs, you know, and, and how dare you change something without our approval. Um, and so it's been this delicate balance where we, we go and kind of lightly solicit their opinions. We ask, hey, what do you think about something we're thinking about working on? Um, and many times the, it'll be in contrast to, you know, what they want, even though it serves a broader business objective. Right? So have you lost a lot of your early adopters and power users over time? I remember at the first CMS, the guy at the who built the community for Airbnb and Yelp, she spoke about the evolution of communities and how like, it's okay to have people be in the community because it's not a fit for them anymore. That's naturally going to happen as your community grows. Have you seen a lot of that kind of turnover? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, what's interesting is like a lot of the, when we look back at our cohorts, uh, the folks who came in from Reddit you know, years ago are still some of the most, you know, highly retained users. And, you know, that's very much a characteristic of really adopter behavior and so on and so forth. But, uh, yeah, you know, a lot of folks will say, look, you guys aren't really focused as much on the gamification right now as you claim to be. And that's what I came here for. And that's... Improving that element it continues to be on the roadmap, but we also have priorities as a business, and so we have to, you know, make sure that we're growing in certain ways um, to continue on our mission. And so it's it's difficult to communicate that at times because you see the forest, but they just see the trees, right? And uh, it's and especially when you're a startup and you're not even sure exactly what you're going to do will work, it's hard to go in front of someone and explain. Well, we think we need to build these foundational elements in sequence so that we get to this broader goal. But they're not going to see that. They're not going to see the bigger picture. They're just going to see, oh, this app update really sucks. Like, why did we change this, right? And it's all part, part of the bigger picture, but it's probably not the wise thing to, sh to share, like, well, this is what we think it happen happens in two years, right? Um, so we have to think about it from a macro perspective instead of thinking about it from a micro perspective. And so certainly, you know, plenty of those folks have left. Um, and we've seen the kind of demographics and user behavior shift over time. So it's interesting to dig into that a little bit more. You're building a community that is a business, correct? In some ways. I, I'm a little hesitant to call the community itself the business. Why is it? Um, well, I think it's very difficult to monetize a community and make a business out of it. Um, it has to be very well designed to serve that purpose. And for us, um, so, uh, for us as a business, what we're really focused on today is uh, providing an online coaching service. So the idea is that we're, we have a marketplace of personal trainers who can offer their virtual coaching services to our users and uh, set up private programs, uh, provide workouts, customize nutrition plans, and so on, and coach those users over time to reach a certain goal. And uh, that's found a lot of traction. It's growing well. Uh, but it's radically different. Well, I shouldn't say right. It's quite different from what we started off as. And you, you started trying to make the community into a business, right? So what I'll say is that some of the coaches on our platform um, have been, or I should say are power users of the community, right? These are folks who have already been spending lots of time on the platform. They've built you know, followings in the thousands or sometimes tens of thousands of users. And they just happen to be really helpful, actively engaged members of the community who also have to be trainers and are certified and maybe even do some coaching uh, offline. And so those were prime examples for us to go and approach them and say, look, we're building this platform where you can actually start to make money off this in a way that's really aligned with our objectives and your objectives and the community's own good. How are you making money or trying to make money before the uh, training programs? So before we introduced the training programs, we had a, and we still do, have a premium membership called Photography Hero. And uh, the idea behind Hero is uh, you get a number of extra features. Um, for that membership, it's $5 a month. And uh, the funny thing about Photography Hero is that if you were to rank the features or benefits uh, for why you would sign up for it, yes, there's things like private messaging, and there's things like you know kind of insight reports on how you're doing, but 
pretty much at the top is uh, let's feed the devs. <laughs> and so it, they're just like, okay, they they feel this kinship to, with the, the community, but also for the team um, to make sure that the, the business continues to run. Uh, but we knew that that in and of itself probably wasn't going to support um, the size of the business and mission that we really want to build. Um, so you know, Photography Hero continues to be kind of a way for these users to support the community and the team, um, but our shift and focus has really gone toward uh, the, the online coaching now. So it sounds like, so you had a community and then you started building products kind of for that community, which some, is counter to what a lot of other companies do, they build products and then they try to build a community around those products and for it. Um, do you have any thoughts on which approach might be better? Um, I don't know if it's better or worse. I think for us, you know, it's a specific case where, you know, a lot of the traction that we had was in the community, right? And, and that's kind of what we became known for as opposed to, yeah, photography is the best workout tracker on the block. No one's going to really say that. Um, and then even if they were to say that, what does that really mean? Workout tracking in itself is kind of a menial task in a lot of ways. Um, so that's what was interesting to people. I was like, wow, really use it. Uh, this really awesome community. Uh, but it presents its own unique set of challenges because now you're beholden to the uh, opinions of the community and you have to sift through the noise, you have to make sure that you're not just listening to the very vocal minority, uh, you have to look through the data, figure out quantitatively, are people joining, are they leaving based on X, Y, Z parts of the experience. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult because you, it's not just how are we solve the problem, and what's the best way to do that, but you also have to like take into consideration the signal uh, from the community as well and, and figuring out if it's even worth paying attention to. Are, are you measuring how much your investment in the community side of things is translating to actual revenue or business value in the long run? Um, it's hard to say. I, we, we don't track, we're not very quantitative in terms of community management or activity in terms of the core business. And what's interesting about us when we're noticing is a lot of folks who are signing up for the coaching product is, are people who um, weren't very social to begin with. Um, what we found is that community serves a particular need for a particular part of the user base. So up to even 50% of our users are not particularly interested in being social on the site or the app, um, which may surprise some people because we're known for that. Uh, but for those folks, they're really interested in getting the utility of the workout tracking as a core part of the experience. And so, you know, when we introduce the online coaching aspect, we're like, okay, great, this can solve this problem for me because I'm going to get this uh, direct expert guidance. But it's okay, I don't really need to interact with these strangers. I'm not really sure of that value. Um, and so there's this interesting dynamic where, on the other side, some people in the community will say, um, why would I need to sign up with a coach? I've got this amazingly positive community that I can rely on to answer any question that I have or support me if I'm going through a rough time. And so there's this tension that we're, that we're kind of experiencing um, and we're trying to make sure that we both support the needs of the community while also building a sustainable business. So there's some people who can get a lot of value out of other people and then other users who tend to need more guidance and do that too. Right? So I think that the folks who get really engaged in the community are a special type, right? There are folks who have, they already have the, uh, they have the personality for it, right? Many people aren't interested in that speaking with other strangers on the internet. Um, but if you're the type of persona who's interested in doing that over time, that's great. Um, but that's not all that we do, right? And, and it, it may turn out that the community itself, the active community, isn't the most monetizable aspect of the business, but it's great because it creates this very vibrant environment that's welcome to anybody. And when people come into the top of the funnel, they may either end up as part of the community or they may end up you know, going with a social product and I want to do this privately, or some hybrid of the two. Uh, but we're still, to be honest, we're still figuring that out. That's really interesting, because I think like a lot of people, they'll track like the power users in their community and see like how much revenue are they bringing in individually, and they really try to correlate like revenue or these metrics to just the members of the community. What you're saying is you've seen a lot of value from the community members that isn't necessarily tied directly to revenue, but just because those people aren't the ones paying for it doesn't mean they're bringing not right. Right. There's, there's intangible benefits that the community offers, um, both for brand, for growth, uh, for overall usage, <clears throat> and for sure a lot of folks who you know, are active users because of the community will eventually then convert to a paid customer as a business. Can you tell that to every other CEO in the world? 
Uh, I get what you're saying there. Um, case by case basis, man. <laughs> one at a time. Uh, cool. So you built this massive community. What are like the one or two key things that you think uh, people in this room might be able to take and apply to their own work building community to keep people excited and engaged and active? Um, yes, this is something I've been thinking about for a while now, and in terms of community, I think what's really interesting is to take a look at how uh, cults or tribes work, right? Uh, cults and tribes, they all have their own unique set of uh, language and rituals and sacred objects, and uh, these are all elements that uh, bind individuals together and create a shared identity and a shared experience. And so, you know, I think the word community is often misused in a lot of contexts. Oh, is it? Yeah, right? So people will say, oh yeah, we put on a Facebook comments widget inside of our blog, and all of a sudden we have a community. It's like, no, you don't. Like, that's, that's, that's absurd, right? All you're gonna run into is people, some guy in California, some guy in Kansas, like yelling at each other, calling each other idiots, because they're never gonna meet each other, and they're like arguing over a blog post. That's not a community, right? Um, the community is really about, like I said, I think um, the analogy I used recently in another conversation I was having was, um, you know, it's relevant to us, is you look at CrossFit, right? So CrossFit, for those who don't know, is a very high intensity uh, workout approach or methodology, I use that term loosely, um, that uses a mix of things like circuit training, Olympic lifting, um, gymnastics, and so on uh, to, you know, help meet your goals. But what's interesting about CrossFit is that it's grown in explosively over the past 10 years. And uh, a large part of that is because when you join a CrossFit gym, or, or box they call it, um, you, you join a family and you, and you join a cult. And if you've met anyone who, who does CrossFit, you know it, or anyone in here who does CrossFit, you'll know they can't shut the hell up about CrossFit, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> and what's interesting about it is because they, they kind of have formed some new sense of identity because they're taking on different languages, uh, vernacular, um, rituals, they, they, they shift their entire priority list. And uh, that's what I would kind of encourage you guys to think about when you build your own communities is if you can create that sense of exclusivity, right? It's kind of, I'm part of an in crowd because I'm using this lingo that no one else is really using, but I can kind of look across the room and identify someone else and kind of like, yeah, we're part of the same tribe. They call them fistocrats? Fittocrats. 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 Fittocrats sounds uh, way <laughs> That's a different community I'm a part of. So. <laughs> it's that time of the conference. I've been drinking already. I've been drinking all day. I mean, so I think that's a big part of why your community's been so successful, right? It's, People aren't just a member of this fitness community, they're, they're fiddlecrats. Right, and, and here's, a, here's a quick takeaway, right? So, um, as, as Facebook popularized the use of like as a social signal, um, you know, to, to create a piece of signal on a piece of content, um, we used props, right? Like a fist bump, right? Give props. And that eventually embedded itself inside the community as this piece of the vernacular that people were always talking about. And uh, it, it just, it was just unique and different enough from a like to be interesting. And, and now it's become a very regular part of the vernacular. So you know, finding those ways to, again, just work your way into those people's kind of common language, um, but it's unique to your community, I think are really strong approaches to building something defensible and steady. Yeah, that's totally backed up. If you ever have a chance to check out The Sense of Community Theory by David McMillan, um, he was one of our speakers at our first conference. He developed this theory 30 years ago and it holds perfectly true today. Um, and it's around exclusivity, symbolism, how if you wear, you know, frat letters on your shirt or team letters or these identity and symbols, uh, that's what really connects people to each other. Cool. So we're going to open it up to a few questions from the audience. Does anybody have any questions? Or did you embrace that immediately? 
Um, I think we've done a really good job of recognizing what is it that we're actually solving for the user. Because when you're starting any new venture, you're really not sure, and that's always going to shift. Um, <clears throat> identity, you use the word identity crisis, and I think that's something that we've definitely gone through uh, quite a bit. And you know, for me, my job um, as a co-founder and CEO is always to be pitching the business and describing that to people very quickly. And it always changed, right? In 2010, 2011, it's like, we're a game. You play a level up your fitness. And some people would get that, and others would be like, what the hell does that mean, right? Um, and then in 2012, 2013, we were really describing this as we're a social network for health and fitness. Um, we were starting to de-emphasize the gamification elements, um, much to the displeasure of a lot of folks in the community. And now, uh, for us, we really describe it as we help you get in better shape through community and coaching. So we're making sure to emphasize, emphasize that coaching part. Um, and we feel very secure in our identity around that because we have a lot of conviction that that coaching element is really, really critical to solving that key customer problem out there for folks. So, um, you know, it, it, it's going to happen in these kind of um, fits and spurts where you're, you're going to be confused as to who you really are, eventually you find clarity, and then you're at a good spot, then maybe something changes in the market or your understanding of the business and the, and the um, consumers, and then you kind of go through that uh, walk in the wilderness again, and you really just have the soul search once more. And I think every business goes through that to some extent. Um, but you know, once we do find that and uh, we're confident in it, then we just kind of start to charge forward. Uh, I'm interested in like your your thoughts on the idea of like kind of monetizing the trainers. Um, Sure, yeah, it's a great question. Um, so for us, we have you know an application process. So as a trainer, I might go to photography, fill out my info on a form, and say, here's my background. I really like to be part of the, the uh, community or the platform, I should say. Uh, we don't require you to be a pre-existing member of the community. We highly encourage it, and we, we give preference to those folks who have already been around. Uh, but it's not a strict requirement. Um, the things that we really look for are you know, a lot of it just comes out of the application, right? Like, how effectively can you express yourself in the written word because a lot of the interaction that occurs between the coaches and the clients today on Photography are through text. Um, you know, there's photo, there's video, and, you know, we're starting to build out other channels, but text is a huge part of it. And, you know, can we, by reading this application, can we get a sense that they have a high sense of empathy? Do you have, do they have experience with clients? That's a huge part. Um, do they know exactly who they're going for? Because understanding your key demographic is really, really important as well. So these are all factors we take into consideration in addition to your certification. Uh, we look at your online presence. Do you have an online identity already that we can look into and, and determine if that's a good fit or not? Um, once we've applied, once a coach has been approved, then there's also you know, a pretty heavy, high-touch onboarding process where you know, our team will work with them to figure out how do you best market yourself, how do you figure out the positioning, um, exactly the pricing, what you're offering, um, and then putting that out to the rest of the community. Um, in addition to how do you use our tools, how do you make sure that you're providing the best customer experience possible. So it, it's a pretty high touch experience right now. All right, thank you very much, Brian, for sharing your story with us.